Good morning, everyone. Very warm welcome to the IFG on this very rainy day. Thank you very much indeed for coming. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm the director of the Institute. And I'm delighted to be here with Andy Haldane for this conversation about how to make levelling up work. Before we kick off, a few um, housekeeping arrangements, which I'm going to read very carefully, just because I have occasionally got the wrong hashtag. In this case, it is IFG levelling up, and we're live tweeting from IFG events. Please do follow and tweet along. And I know a lot of people are signed on online, a very sensible um, response to the tube strike, uh, strike today in, in London. Um, do send in questions. Uh, some are coming through now, that, and that can be now. And we will take as many as we can from the room and from online. So thanks very much indeed. We're going to have a video and sound recording out within 24 hours on our website. Well, Andy doesn't need an awful lot of introduction, particularly not for people who come to IFG events quite a bit. Um, but he is, as you know, the chief executive of the RSA. I could even call that a rival think tank, except that um, on about the, when he was appointed in September, he immediately began a six-month secondment as permanent secretary of Leveling Up and has been working, we were just discussing before, hovering between the cabinet office and Michael Gove's uh, department on exactly that. And that finishes at the end of this month, this month being March. He did spend the last seven um, years at the bank of his 30 years, I think it was, at the Bank of England as chief economist. And that is the role in which he's talked to us in the past as well about how to get growth and what you do about these subjects now brought together under the government's phrase of levelling up. <coughs> so, Andy, very warm welcome. Bronwyn, thank you. Great to be back. Thanks very much for coming. So, where, um, let's start with white paper, the government's white paper, which did come out, and it was very long and detailed, and you are, I think, in the process of writing a, you know, a paper on, on that. What should we make of the phrase levelling up? Do you think that that white paper answered the many, many questions put by lots of people, including uh, my, my colleagues over here, about what levelling up actually means? I hope so. Um, certainly one of uh, the key aims of that white paper was to answer the question that people have been asking for at least 18 months, actually. You know, what do you concretely mean uh, by levelling up? How will we know whether we're doing that, how will we know whether we've got there? Um, and in a way, um, the answer to those questions was provided in the form of the 12 missions that we set out. Mm -hmm. One of their purposes was to provide, I hope, uh, complete clarity about how we know we were making progress towards uh, level. And these up. aren't targets, to be clear, they're missions. That's right. Which is something different. It is different, yeah. So um, these aren't, you know, short-term delivery targets uh, in a sort of governmental sense. These really are medium-term plans uh, to reach a, you know, a loftier goal uh, in ways that will require action, not just by government but by all of society, by the private sector, by civil mm. society, by academia and, and, and beyond. We'll come on to some of those points about the private sector and so on, but maybe you can give us an example of a mission that you can still measure. So how will we know whether we've achieved one of these missions? Yeah. Well, let me take uh, one of them, a very concrete one, our devolution. I'm sure we'll say more about devolution during the yeah. course of this. So our devolution mission, um, very easy to observe whether we've... Um, achieved this is that by 2030, um, we are seeking that uh, every part of England that wishes to have a devolution deal has a devolution deal. Right now, it's about 50-50. So the plan is by 2030, everyone that wants one has got one. And crucially, everyone that's got one has powers that are at or approaching those of the place, the region, that's currently got most powers, which would currently be London. So I'd say that's a pretty ambitious mission, given the starting, given the starting point. Um, but I think eminently achievable if we go about this in a transformative way. I think, you know, if that's where we get by 2030, Bronwyn, yeah. people really will notice the difference. And for all the other 11 missions... If they would be satisfied, people really would notice the difference. And for me, that is the absolute key. 
uh, I found that fairly persuasive. And we write an awful lot about devolution here and, and a lot about devolution within England. But it, that, you know, that one is about structure, about process, about where government yeah. is and so on. What about the ones that are actually to do with, uh, with, with growth, with uh, the standards of, of the quality of people's lives, the quality of health and education, yeah. what, what people take as being the core of leveling up? Yeah, yeah. Well, on those, uh, and let's take a couple that sit I think, naturally together, which would be living standards and longevity. You know, when you're looking to what are the key metrics of how we've fallen short historically on levelling up, people often look towards, including the Prime Minister in his speech, uh, living standards, the widening divergence between levels of pay or productivity in different places, lots of P's in there, uh, and longevity. Mm. The fact that we see this wide and widening gap mm. in healthy life expectancy in different parts. And, and, and it's, it's healthy life expectancy as well as life expectancy. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I mean, the, that dimensions yeah. as a more important, actually, yeah. to people's life satisfaction. Yeah. We know in both of those cases, give or take, we have had 70 years uh, of those disparities widening between places over time. And the mission we set ourselves, in both of those two cases, is to turn the tide. Uh, it, to turn those divergent forces into convergent forces. And that is no small ask. You know, it's a big task to reverse the course of, for example, um, healthy life ex expectancy. Um, which is why I think having that medium-term orientation is, is, absolutely, is absolutely crucial. So, you know, those are two where it's about turning the tide, yeah. reversing the disparities, which I think are, would, would, would meet most people's common or garden definition of leveling up. I think that's exactly right, but turning the tide is something that governments um, for decades have tried to do. These are long-standing social trends. There are a lot of factors yeah. acting in. How much is the government putting weight on, on actual ach achievement of targets within a certain number of years? Yeah, I mean, the idea is um, set, set a point on the horizon where it's realistic to expect uh, the tide could be turned. That wouldn't be two years ahead or three years ahead. It wouldn't be a spending review period. Mm. That would need to be at least a decade. Mm. And these are actually rolling decadal missions. Um, once you fix that point on the horizon, you can draw a line back to the today, right? and say, look, this is the critical path we will need to be on to meet this mission. Is policy today doing sufficient? Is enough being done to put us on that critical path? And if not, how do we course correct? That is the power of the mission, not just that it picks a point on the horizon, but that it enables you to draw then a point back to where we are today, and then government's feet can be held to the flame, period by period, in our case, mm. annually, because there'll be a requirement in statute mm. that the government reports annually on progress towards their mission. And that provides, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't guarantee success. What it does provide is a pretty sharp set of incentives, mm. expectations for action. It prompts those difficult questions of government about whether enough is being done. And that is the essence mm. of system change, and system change is what we need. There's been a lot of talk about how place-based, and that awful bit of jargon, this is, it's looking at about inequality between places as opposed to inequality uh, between people, which might be rather great within one particular place. Why has the government taken this, this approach of looking at, at places and trying to level those up? And, you, you know, and then there's you know, the question that comes after that, and you would you be very familiar with this, this discussion, but whether all places can be leveled up, whether they should be, hmm. whether some should, uh, whether the government should say to some of them, look, we can make your life much nicer, but actually you're, you don't have and won't have the jobs, the high-value jobs um, that, um, that, that some other place, probably a city, has, and maybe in, from your nicer place than it is now, you're going to commute to those places. Yeah. How, how is the, why has the government taken this particular view of place? 
Yeah. I mean, leveling up is about people too. Uh, in fact, that's all it's about. Um, success will come when people notice a difference, visibly, uh, materially, uh, in their communities, on their high streets. Um, and the people dimension of this is, is obviously crucial, you know, because, you know, for many people, their history is their destiny. Uh, that's the social mobility problem. Uh, but for many people, too, their geography is their destiny. In other words, place really matters, as well as people uh, mattering. And there's a strong intersectionality, a very difficult word to say, having seven syllables, between the two. You know, so it is the case uh, that people um, are doubly um, disadvantaged uh, by their history and their geography, and the two tend to go together. Uh, that is a double whammy for some people in some places. So I think acting on the people dimension of this through education and skills and acting on the place dimension of this mm. through levelling up, for me, for me, speaks to both sets of problems and both are acute, mm. both matter. Well, do you think the government needs to say to some, some places look, we're not going to level you up in quite the way you might expect. This is what you can right. expect, but you're right. not going to be right. as shiny as Leeds or Cardiff or yeah, yeah, yeah. London, whatever. Yeah, so um, yeah, for me, it would be deeply implausible. It would defy the laws of economic uh, gravity to think that every place across the UK, say, would have the same levels of productivity and therefore of pay. That, for me, would be a fanciful notion. Fanciful because we know there are benefits, um, uh, economies of scale and economies of scope when it comes to place building. You know, economists give us a fancy name, they call it agglomeration, mm. but it's basically lumping things in the same place has positive spillover benefits. Mm. That's why city and city regions do well mm. and have higher levels of productivity on average. It'd be fanciful to think that every rural retreat, every rural place, every village, every town could be levelled up to, let's take, top of the pops, London levels of productivity mm. and pay. Are there other dimensions of levelling up, of the missions, that could plausibly equalised? Yes, there are. Because guess what? There are some huge benefits of living in some of those towns or villages or more rural retreats that aren't measured in terms mm. of pure productivity and pay, but are measured in terms of lifestyle and green space and green spaces and leisure facilities and all the things that we know are really important to people's life satisfaction. And that's why, that's why having well-being as another fulcrum of levelling up alongside mm. productivity is so important. It's fanciful to think we could equalise productivity and pay. It is not at all fanciful to think we could equalise levels of well-being across the UK. No, that you come back to the question of how, of how to ma manage, um, how to measure them. I guess is there enough money? This the white paper came out after the spending review. Lots of money had already been doled out uh, around Whitehall, um, and there was the usual scrambling to work out what was new money and uh, devoted to this white paper and what was um, uh, an Im uh, a sort of grabbing of money that had al already been labelled. What's your view of this? Yeah. Well, I mean, these are 20, 30 missions, so no three-year spending review is going to be enough to make good on the missions. You know, that's a mm. statement of the, of the obvious, but I'll, I'll make that obvious point. Um, but there's something more general here, Bronwyn. Um, I'm not saying this is an accusation at the level of the uh, Institute for Government, but it's, it's true of a lot of the public commentary, uh, which is the focus on the new rather than the focus on the news, right? Um, I mean, the truth is, levelling up sounds, isn't... Sounds cute, but what, what, what do you mean? Um, I mean, so, well, let me give you a concrete example. People ask, uh, what extra money is coming forward in this, in this voluminous mm. tome that hasn't already been announced? Um, that's sort of a relevant question, but it's not the most relevant question. Because the truth, truth is, government is already spending, guess what, quite a lot of money. You're getting on towards 900 billion pounds uh, of money. If you take that existing spend, not new, but 
news, existing spend, and tilt it ever so much in the direction of poorer areas, then that, will have, that could have a dramatically bigger impact, quantitatively, than any new mm. pot. So I take that under a billion. I tilt it by a mere 1%, and I create extra finances for the poorer parts of the UK that are twice the size of the levelling up fund, a new pot mm. uh, of money. So this is not always, often not mainly, about the increment, the new. It's often about what you do with the old, how you spend your existing money. Mm. And on that, the white, white paper signalled a pretty shift, pretty significant re-tilting mm. of budgets in a way that should really support levelling up in quantitatively mm. significant ways. Take the government's procurement budget. You know a lot about this. £300 billion. A small slither of that gets redirected, which is possible now, under the Social Value Act, and you're talking real money. So um, I think getting this in context is really important. Again, I, I find that very uh, persuasive, but it, for obvious reasons, didn't go down very well in, in London, and indeed with the mayor of London, um, who's saying, oh, that, that's London being leveled down. And the way you're putting it, and it's just a tiny tilt and small sums of money, and uh, it's a tiny tilt on a big, big pot and going to poor areas, um, the message is London won't, uh, won't feel it, won't notice, this won't hurt. But is there a counter-argument that the country needs to invest in its capital city hmm. and that uh, it is more money that is needed, <clears throat> not just a tilt to, which would disadvantage the capital city? Yeah. Well, I mean, just to that point, there's absolutely no desire, uh, I think on anyone's part, uh, to in any sense disadvantage uh, London. I mean, the truth is, as you know, Bronwyn, London is itself the home to significant pockets of deprivation. Um, on some definitions, there are many more poorer people in London than any other part of the, the UK. So London is no monolith and will not be treated in a monolithic way, and nor will any other part of the UK. The truth is, the UK's economic geography is a tremendously variegated picture. And you do see, even within prosperous parts, you have pockets of affluence and deprivation sitting right next to each other in every part of the UK. And they need levelling up every bit as much as um, parts outside the successful, uh, outside the successful uh, city regions. So let me take a concrete example of how um, we can do this in a way that doesn't disadvantage uh, the well-performing parts. So let's take research and development. The UK is blessed, as we all know, with some fantastic uh, universities, fantastic research centres, uh, and the Golden Triangle uh, really is uh, a very fertile, incredibly fertile um, ground for innovation, for technology, for startups, for scale ups, for, for clusters of various types. It would be deeply foolish to, whatever you want to call it, cut down that tall poppy. When it comes to R&D spending, though, because the pot is increasing, we can maintain support for the Golden Triangle while at the same time fertilizing new ground of innovation clusters elsewhere around the country. And that is what's in the white paper. That is now in the... All right, so that's a bit of new money. You're, you're pointing the R&D there yeah. as, as one of the things. That... Exactly. Why have governments found this so hard? Because it isn't just this government. We have a famous chart, famous in, in the IFG circles anyway, which looks at kind of 30, 40 years of initiatives on regional policy, industrial policy, further education. And there are lots and lots. Almost every government has one, uh, often with a brand new phrase. Um, and they last about the term of that government. Yeah. And then the next one comes along and says, no, no, you got it all wrong. Um, this is still one of the, the country's great problems, um, but here we're going with our, with our funds. Um, some of these persist over governments, but many don't. Yeah. The, the, these are not unknown problems, um, and the attempt to find solutions mm -hmm. um, to inequalities within the UK, um, to parts of the country that have got stuck to productivity, which we spent a great deal of time looking at and, and talking and writing about, 
why, why, um, why, have, why have governments found this so hard and why does this plan stand a better chance? Yeah. Well, I think your diagnosis, IFG's diagnosis is bang on. It's shared in our white paper. In fact, we reference mm. you extensively in our white paper, uh, Bronwyn, on exactly this point. I mean, there's lots of... I'm not fishing for ads, but thank you. <laughs> it's, there, it's there already. You're welcome. Um, um, and it comes down to longevity. I mean, as you say, these things scarcely lack... Longevity lacked, of the plans. Of the plans. Yes. They're scarcely lack. Uh, we have so, lacked so therefore, policies. in a way, of the government. What's different this time? What secures that longevity? Nothing guarantees it. What gives me some degree of faith, mm. quite a degree of faith, that this time might be different? Well, one element uh, is the missions. Long-term orientation, strong incentives through transparency and accountability and all that good stuff. That would be one. Uh, a second uh, is how we are seeking to reshape um, how central government, how Whitehall makes its decisions. Because the truth is, historically, very largely, um, uh, central government has not necessarily gone about its business, its decisions, in a spatially aware way. It hasn't actively sought to do that le levelling up. There's been some automatic stabiliser ways of doing that. Mm. But, and the reason I know that with a degree of confidence is because it's still the case today that many government departments couldn't tell you what their geographic footprint looks like. Mm. They haven't got the data to enable those choices to have been made. They've been operating effectively place blind. So can we, should we, are we going to rectify that? Of course. And there's a requirement in here that every government department now needs to make clear, lay bare its geographic footprint as a basis for spatially mm. aware decision making. Indeed, through the accountability framework, the outcomes framework, they'll have to publicly declare what they're doing to make good on their levelling up, uh, on the levelling up missions through the actions that they're yeah. taking uh, with their spending. That is different. I know a cabinet subcommittee is not the answer to any question in particular, but we now do have a cabinet subcommittee that meets weekly uh, on levelling up, a means of bringing together uh, the different departments, the different ministers, mm. and having a joined up conversation about not just what we are doing for Stoke or Sunderland or Sheffield, but also a joined-up conversation. You are bringing, Minister, mm. a white paper on schools. You are bringing a white paper mm. on health disparities. Presumably in that white paper, you will want to lay bare mm. what contribution that is making to levelling up. That's a conversation that hasn't, I think, happened previously and will now happen mm. through this vehicle of the weekly uh, cabinet. Uh, committees and those committees can be they can be everything they can really bring everyone together or, or they can be nothing if the you know the the, the, the resources and, and and the determination from the top um, is not there or, uh, the, um, the top or high up I guess and um, I, I will take Michael Gove as a substitute for the very top on that but do you think Whitehall is good at this you talk about a lot of data a lot of knowledge a lot of data that you, that you now want from departments um, about place, well, you know, what kind of shape is Whitehall in to deliver that enormous plan? Mm -hmm. I mean, time will tell, ultimately, on that. Let me make the following points. So, I mean, the, the, I'm afraid the, that is a phrase that we banned from the IFC. Thank Just, you. Your, your, um, your, until view, now, your view right now would be what? Um, look, it, it will tell, but I, it will tell lots of things. Um, I'm optimistic. Here's why I'm optimistic. One, uh, you need... Uh, the raw ingredients, and one of the raw ingredients is data. Uh, and we have a big floor. I know it's boring, I know it's arid, but it's really important that we have the tools of the trade to understand the choices that we're making, mm. and that will, that, and that will, uh, uh, and that will uh, change. Uh, two, um, uh, where the people themselves sit. Mm. There is a big push, as you know, through the Places mm. for Growth programme to get mm. more civil mm. servants outside of the capital, mm. extra 20,000 mm. by 2030. Uh, that, I think, makes a difference. I mean, what, and I'm really interested in this. What, and I was coming on to this point, in fact. Um, what, what is the difference it makes? Is it change of view? Um, is it more connection with people around the country? I mean, do they, do they see the country differently? Do they find out about it? Um, does it just does it diffuse the kind of central block of people? What is the valuable difference Benefit. that it makes? Oh, that, I, think there's, there's, um, I think there are, there are benefits 
of you know, geographical distance from the rest of the machine. Uh, I think uh, it is through that that you pick up uh, local knowledge and local relationships and local contacts. I think all of these uh, are positive steps uh, in, uh, in the right direction. Let me make this point as well, actually, Bronwyn. One point I've, I've been struck by, and I wouldn't have guessed this going in, um, which is there is a huge amount of enthusiasm among mm. civil servants for the levelling up uh, project. Mm. And the reason for that, the reason for that, which is now obvious to me, uh, is because everyone's from somewhere. And most people in the civil service are not from London. Uh, they know where the place where they grew up is like and what it might need. Mm. So actually, um, a combination of much better data, a relocation of people, a rewiring of the Whitehall machinery, mm. and this, I think, innate sense among civil servants that this is the right thing to do for their place, gives me hope that this could be, mm. with a nudge, with a nurdle, with a rewire, could make all the difference. So that'd be a second reason, and the third is Devo. Which, right, is about come up, which is what the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, so I'm going to... Can we just pause for a second? I just want to weave in a question from Simon Briscoe because it's exactly on this point. Thank you for sending it, Simon. And, and just wanting to hear a bit more about the data needs. Uh, he says, helpfully, as set out in section 2.3.4 uh, of the uh, uh, white paper. Thank you for the accuracy of your own data. Um, but you're saying for all the diplomatic words, it looks like a complete reboot of government statistics will be needed. Where will the skills and leadership come from and the coordinating and the coordination of, of, of this. And we're talking about wiring and machinery, but these are metaphors. What does it really mean? What does it really mean? That? I'm going to come yeah. on to devolution in a yeah. second. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Simon, especially for uh, referencing one of my favorite sections, 2.3.4. <laughs> um, um, what does it mean in practice? Um, we launched uh, just ahead of the white paper, the ONS launched their own subnational data strategy. Right, which is recognizing, long recognized by the way, uh, the UK PLC's uh, subnational data is not up to snuff. Truth be told, some way mm. short mm. of any approach to international best practice. They are now on that, and that will deliver uh, tangible improvements, uh, I think, uh, in the fullness of time to what will be available to us. Accompanying that, uh, government itself needs a better window on its own world, how it is spending its mm. uh, resources, and also how it's using its data. Mm. Because um, contained in the bowels of many Whitehall buildings are a treasure trove of admin data that haven't fully been brought to bear yet mm. and used for all sorts of things, including for mm. uh, leveling up. There is a plethora, a glowing plethora, as you all know, of private sector data sources of various types that help us tell stories about mm. localities, often in incredibly uh, granular uh, detail, actually. Um, that, too, needs to be brought uh, into the fold. And we're setting up this new local government body, not to be confused with Audit Commission 2.0, whose job it will be to, brought, to draw together these ragged edge of myriad data sources, some public, some private, some admin, some beyond, uh, to try and make sense of it in locality so we can see what's going on but as importantly, we can see whether our interventions are having the impact they need to have mm. to learn from experience. So I hope that provides a bit of an answer mm. to, to Simon's mm. question. This, and that's true of almost everything in here, will need to be a collective effort. To think that central government has all the answers here, again, we totally mm. fanciful. There is a spatial data unit being set up in Michael Gove's department as we speak. Mm. That will be important. Is that the answer to all our prayers? Of course it isn't, and of course it can't be. Oh, thank you for that. And so coming on to devolution, which we've, we've been talking about through all this, but it, it is one of the most ambitious bits in the white paper. And it does talk, as you were talking right at the beginning, um, about potentially devolving a lot of things to local areas if they want them, including within, within England. Um, how does that work? Do they have to say that they want it? Does it happen anyway? Does, um, does the famously the power to raise money or collect money or um, get, get, get allocated or just more power to spend a bit more money? Yep. Interesting what you said about the ambitious thing, actually. It's quite interesting. 
this is, a, this is a general point. I will take a, go to your question after that. Um, you said the Devo plan is ambitious. I was in Parliament yesterday giving evidence. Mm. Hor horribly unambitious <laughs> Devo plans, we were told then. It's been true of lots of bits of the white paper. There are those that say, you'll never achieve that, and those that are say, that's not, nothing like ambitious enough, which, which mm. it gives me some reassurance we've landed in an okay place. They On can, Devo... They, they can both be true. They can both be yeah. true, that's true. Um, <laughs> run over in both directions. Um, <laughs> The, um, on, on, on Devo, um, yeah, my sense on that is that, you know, if someone had said to me, give me as a forward contract uh, ahead of my six months, this is where we'll land at the very start, I'd have taken this where we landed on Devo. I think we did mm -hmm. push the boat out further than I thought we, thought we might on Devo, um, which is, you know, two extra American combined authorities, nine extra county deals, all the rest of it. Mm. Um, how will it work in practice? Um, yes, I mean, we, 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 you know, let's take county deals. Um, we, we announced last year that we were going to pursue this as a way of uh, evolving Devo beyond city regions uh, and invited places to come uh, and approach us if they would like to have a Devo deal from that longer list. Uh, we boiled that down to nine that we'll take forward in the first, uh, in the first wave. That is the start of what mm -hmm. will be a negotiation uh, between uh, government and with them, uh, about what, their, what their plans are, what their aspirations are, and how well they, they fit with the framework for devolution that we've set out in the white paper. And, and for me, that is the key point, um, Bronwyn, from the white mm. paper, that you know, hitherto, this has been a bit ad hoc. Mm -hmm. uh, so having some framework, three tiers with accompanying powers set out, mm -hmm. what you need to do as a place to get powers X, Y, or Z, is, I think, a useful step mm -hmm. forward. Ultimately, it's still for the place themselves to decide mm -hmm. what structure they want, what powers they wish to have, but I hope that provides, I think, considerably greater clarity and consistency hmm. from government than we've had so far. Hmm. Okay, well, thanks. Let's, um, let's turn to questions um, uh, in the room and uh, online. I'm going, I'm going to begin with one, um, which is rather coyly anonymous. Um, it seems to be not a subject on which one has to be anonymous, but I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, push on that. Uh, others, if Ukraine or digital re regulation, I might, I might see the, the point. Um, we've got a lot of anonymous ones. But anyway, it's a good anonymous question, which is, uh, you talked about longevity. What happens when Andy Holding leaves at the end of the month? Where, who will the continuity come from? Well, there'll be a big sigh of relief from the department, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, um, we're working now, the department is working on now, um, and indeed all government departments are working on now, how we turn the uh, recommendations in here, anywhere between 70 and 140 new ones, uh, into a delivery plan. Uh, that, is being, uh, that is being drawn up. Not just what we do, but who is responsible for doing it, um, that will then be the blueprint that is used for deliberations among that cabinet committee that I mentioned that Michael chairs on uh, a weekly basis. Uh, and it's through that mechanism that we will turn the words uh, into action. I think it's fair to say that we'll be seeking to take some very concrete, some very tangible actions to make this real in the very near term. Some of that will be the bill that will go through Parliament, fingers crossed with a fair wind, during the course of the first half uh, mm. of this year. We will be seeking to make good on some of those Devo deals I mentioned uh, earlier on. So I think you will see, pretty much from now, this translate into a delivery plan with individual departments and individually named mm. people in those departments mm. being held accountable for delivering. Right. I will be, be missed not one jot. But is there going to be a successor to your job, another permanent secretary of levelling up? Don't know the answer to that. Is it God's answer? Okay. Thanks very much. Let's take one in the room um, here in the, in the front. Can you wait for the microphone there? Old-fashioned thing. Yeah. 
Hi, Andy. Hi. Um, Victoria Evans from EY. So personally, I was really encouraged to see that devolution featured so heavily in the white paper. Um, however, devolution in itself may not deliver a successful levelling up agenda. So, and there, and there is a risk that it could be perceived as shifting accountability to, to local government. In your view, what do you think central government and, and the role, continued role of central government needs to do to ensure the right policy, empowerment and advocacy is in place uh, to enable levelling up? And what's the right split of accountability? Thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you, Victoria. It, it, it's a, um, completely on point uh, as a, a question, uh, Victoria. An issue we wrestled with, um, I wrestled with, um, in the context of drawing this thing up because absolutely what you say is right, that if we are going to go further down the, the track of devolving more powers, as we are, uh, then accompanying that needs to be increased accountabilities for the discharge of those powers at a, uh, at a local level. Um, lots of ways that can happen, uh, but the idea behind this local government body I mentioned earlier on was precisely... Uh, to shine a searchlight uh, onto all sorts of places, especially those with devolved powers, so that we do have very clear line of sight on how they are being discharged. You know, our local leaders, whether mayors or otherwise, you know, making good uh, on those powers in terms of you know, boosting the living standards and housing and transport and schools and hospitals in their area and giving local leaders and local people the data to understand what's going on, whether the powers have been discharged adequately, is, I think, absolutely crucial for reasons of uh, account, uh, accountability. Um, ultimately, and this goes to your early question as well, um, Bronwyn, a bit, um, what the next wave of devolution won't do, very largely, uh, is to give uh, local leaders tax-raising powers or no further tax-raising powers than they have already. Uh, ultimately, looking way down the track, well after I've uh, left government, that's a conversation we need to have mm. because another accountability device, actually perhaps even the most potent accountability device, is if you, you know, to pick a name randomly, Andy, uh, in the West Midlands... Um, or indeed Greater Manchester, want to spend more on X, Y, or Z, then that's, all, that's, that's fine. But you raise the monies locally to finance X, Y, and Z, and you justify it, or not, to your local uh, electorate. That isn't this wave. But I think ultimately it's an issue we'll need to mm. broach so that we have proper and full alignment of the powers we devolve and the accompanying accountabilities. There have been plenty of examples, as you know, um, of things going wrong when powers and monies have been uh, devolved previously in this country and elsewhere. And that's why I think that you know, having these two things work uh, in lockstep is absolutely uh, crucial. You know, decisions, local decisions, on occasions will be wrong, just as decisions centrally can be wrong as well. Um, with the right accountabilities, there's less chance of that happening, but not no chance of those happening. Okay, thanks very much. And we had a comment from Leslie Ann Nash um, of, of the Cabinet Office um, in this kind of area, uh, saying um, that she thinks we need a permanent secretary of, the, of, of levelling up. Um, just continuing that thread. Let me take one from Anne Breach of Centre for Cities, saying um, the economic role of cities in urban labour markets throughout the white paper striking, to what extent do you think that the UK's starkly unequal economic geography is caused by the underperformance of big cities outside London? And then there's a wistful little bit of the question saying, maybe a percentage share of the total you would like to give. Um, I feel it's a loaded question from the Centre for Cities, actually, <laughs> from, from Anne. Um, uh, but for what it's worth, um, I share the view that um, uh, they have been researching... Um, um, very comprehensively and very persuasively for several years now, which is one of the reasons we um, uh, are especially 
um, an equal country and have become more so uh, is because uh, the UK's second cities, or a number of them, uh, have uh, punched below their weight, at least relative to international com uh, comparators. So I, I do think that is a key part of the uh, diagnosis uh, and a key part of the prescription, therefore, uh, is to build on more the successes of, of many more of those second cities, mm. which include Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, mm. Newcastle, um, Bristol, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Belfast, the list kind of goes mm. on. So mm. plenty of scope there. I'll not translate that into, into numbers. The Centre for Cities number, it's quite a big number, £180 billion, mm. Uh, mm. therefore quite chunky. I'd love it if that was the case. I'm not sure if... That comes from levelling up everyone to London, which might be a stretch. Mm. Uh, nonetheless, the prize is, is certainly sizable. Okay, thank you. Uh, here in the room, Giles Wilkes. Hello, um, hi Andy. Uh, Giles Wilkes, Institute for Government Senior Fellow. Um, I've re I really enjoyed the paper, it's fascinating. But the, um, to be very instrumentalist about it, you talk a lot about holding people accountable for making actions that deliver levelling up or providing the data that helps them in their decision to level up. But I'm still unsure as to what is the action a local bureaucrat or a central government bureaucrat can take to raise the regional productivity of a place. Um, except for one, one exception by implication from much of what you say, which is spending money. In other words, you made that point about 900 billion and tweaking it by 1% means 9 billion going to some places and not presumably to others. Is the answer bluntly here that you think that you can spend public money to raise productivity? Because that comes with, a, um, with a, a supplementary question, which is, if that's the case, are we in this position quite simply because we made a mistake to cut the DCLG budget, as it was then called, quite so hard for 10 or 15 years? Is this just bluntly a, an attempt to dress up what is a fiscal rebalancing, or is there something more clever to it than just that? Great. Uh, thank you, Giles. Um, great question, as ever. So on that, I mean, I wouldn't lay the blame for uh, the failure to levelling up at any one policy intervention, certainly not one over the last 10 years, because the truth is it's a problem that is um, worsened over successive governments and successive policy frameworks, as we've said uh, earlier on. Um, when it comes to you know, what local leaders can do to boost productivity uh, in their place, I think we actually know quite a lot about that now. And, and more than that, I think in lots of places across the UK, we see um, successful examples of this, uh, of this taking place. And often, and interestingly, that doesn't require large slugs of public money. It comes more from purpose of action by local leaders, accompanied with the crowding in of private monies uh, of uh, various types. Give some examples. I was in Cardiff last week. Was it last week? Week before last. Um, speaking to the local council about some of the initiatives they've got underway. Uh, to boost productivity, to um, generate um, higher living standards uh, in Cardiff City region. You know, fantastic project, you know, um, to connect the city centre with Cardiff Bay, to reach out uh, up into the valleys, to make this a legitimate city region agglomerative hub cluster of activity at the macro scale. I visit a community project in the city, uh, Grangetown. Um, and that's a little community hub that is having huge benefits to the social fabric of that place. The reason I mention that is what was the secret source of success in both, for both of those projects for Cardiff? It was a purposive uh, local leader, uh, county council. Uh, it was the mobilization of private sector monies. It was the involvement of local communities. And in both cases involved a slug, or actually a relatively small slug, of central government financing that then crowded in a much larger amount of uh, private sector 
financing. And that's a model, what I call a new model of governance, as distinct from a new model of government, that I think I see replicated right across uh, the UK, in fewer places than I'd wish, but nonetheless, there are enough of those actual or embryonic clusters of private sector activity, sometimes, sometimes nourished and nurtured by a small slug of government finance, sometimes enabled by government removing restrictions, uh, sometimes catalyzed by the coordinating hand of government. But it's a different model than the we spend, we, we, we write the check and you spend uh, model. And I think that's the one I'd like to see nurtured uh, to make a success of just what you say locally. Okay, thanks. Let's take another one uh, in the room here. Uh, Richard Lambert, uh, IFG board. <coughs> Leveling up is an intensely uh, political uh, phrase, uh, closely associated with the uh, present uh, Prime Minister. And it's quite hard to imagine his successor, let alone the leader of uh, opposition, uh, new, uh, from the Labour Party, saying, I really, really care about this. So aren't you going to have to develop some kind of different sort of narrative or some different sort of branding that gives it a wider and longer lasting appeal. I mean, one thinks of um, Big Society and David Cameron. Uh, you're going to have to broaden the narrative somehow. Thank you, Richard. Um, so the, um, the, the origin of um, the slogan, the branding, levelling up, um, uh, is a Johnson. Um, but it's not the one you think. Um, it's Samuel Johnson, 21st of July, 1763, in a diary entry, talking about the levelling doctrine. Um, so this, um, this may be branding, this may be a slogan, but it's, it's an 18th century one, not a 21st uh, century uh, one. Uh, interesting, a, a slogan that has, has stood the test of time, many centuries, as it, as it, as it turns out. But your point, of course, is a very... Uh, a serious one, which is, you know, uh, could the brand, could the slogan get in the way of pursuing uh, this thing? I think it's fair to say um, every political party would put their weight behind the principle, even if the might, um, even if the words stick a little uh, in the uh, in the crawl. Um, I, I would hope um, uh, that you know, in the fullness of time. Um, the other political parties, uh, once they've had time to digest uh, this, would could come forward with their own thoughts, ideas, suggestions, proposals um, for how this might be improved, uh, how this might be given um, greater pace or even greater seriousness than is the case right now. That is the debate I would love to happen uh, in this country because it's that debate that I think will, to go back to Bronwyn's first question, that will give us a hope that this will survive uh, the test of time, successive uh, government. So that, that I hope you know, one of the purposes for me uh, of this is to put down a marker to establish the starting line and then prompt a wider conversation, not just political, but also wider, about how not just we deliver this, but how we go there even further and even faster uh, than is the case uh, right now. I hope events like this, Bromwyn actually, mm. the, one of the main purposes of events like this is to prompt exactly that sort of conversation. Okay, thanks for that. We had one comment flash in. Um, this reminds me of the 1980s and, 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 and this. Um, um, let me just take... Um, one uh, in particular um, online. Um, sorry, there's some very, very good ones online. Um, but Emma Gordon's raised a, a, an aspect we haven't really talked about, which is the, um, how government is dealing with the devolved nations. She says to ensure that the, all these ambitions can be delivered in collaboration, not political competition with them. You obviously saw a fair amount of political competition during uh, coronavirus and during the, the, the pandemic. And then there is this question hanging there about how the Westminster government will distribute uh, the money it says it will make up uh, that previously came from the EU. And so also, but it, it, this is really about working with the devolved nations. We've been talking in a very refreshing way about devolution within England. 
Um, yeah. But there is the uh, already established bit. Uh, there is, and, and I hope, you know, as, as one, um, I hope, of the, the, the common threads that runs through this whole document would be um, you know, the, the desire to make this a UK-wide uh, endeavour, respecting, of course, devolved responsibilities, but a, a generally UK-wide endeavour. Most of the missions are UK-wide uh, missions, hmm. you're recognising... Uh, that there's, there's a common interest in, in pursuing all of them, if not um, uh, most of them, if not, if, if not uh, all of them. That's a conversation we'll be having, uh, a collaborative conversation we'll be having with the devolved uh, governments and administrations uh, over the weeks and months ahead. And I, hope, mm. I think there's absolutely common cause to be struck uh, on, on, on this front. On the... Uh, on the successor to, to EU funds, which is the sh so-called Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, SPF, which is itself, of course, a UK-wide uh, pot uh, of uh, monies. Uh, the government have already said that they will at least match uh, those monies, uh, and including for the devolved authorities and for, and, and for Cornwall. Um, we are working through now, as we speak, uh, the precise perspective for the Shared Prosperity Fund and how mm. that will pan out across mm. uh, England uh, and uh, the other home nations. Mm. Uh, you'll see that in the weeks ahead. Mm. Okay, thank you. Got one in the room here. Hi. Hi. My name's Tess um, and I'm from Big Society Capital. Um, you mentioned that um, achieving levelling up will require smarter spending. And a good example of this are social outcomes contracts. Um, they're little known and have been quietly transforming how government commission really complex public services such as homelessness, yeah. family breakdown, mental health. And in these contracts, um, which you may have heard um, also named social impact bonds, um, government only pays when the outcome is actually achieved and a socially motivated investor provides the upfront working capital. Um, just wondered in that context um, um, what more you think government should do to c encourage that smarter outcomes orientated commissioning and um, yeah, what barriers there may be to achieving this within government. Thank you. Uh, thank you Tess. Um, I mean you may already um, uh, very big supporter um, a big society capital, a very big supporter of social impact bonds and what I think they can seek to uh, achieve. I think the first social impact bond issued in the UK, which I think was sent for St. Giles Trust, the charity, I think um, some of the background work for that was done uh, by the charity I set up, Pro Bono Economics, actually, that fed into the evaluation of that. So from, from the, from the get-go, uh, I've been a fan. I've been disappointed that market has not really caught fire in the way I hoped it might. Maybe you share that disappointment, I don't know. Um, other ways we can, um, uh, can pep it up. Uh, I think, you know, leveling up uh, and the focus on outcomes, the focus on data might be a means of enabling that. I haven't thought that through very concretely, but it's something I think we absolutely do need to think, think through concretely. One of the points we try to make in here, um, I hope with a degree of success, uh, is that success in levelling up isn't just about the conventional, purely financial dimensions of success, like productivity and pay and living standards and all that stuff. There's a bunch of wider stuff. Uh, could be uh, quality of high streets, quality of green spaces, uh, crime. Uh, where without that, levelling up will fail. All of those things, I think, are amenable to measurement, albeit social impact measurement as distinct from economic value measurement. And if so, they too are in principle um, bundleable up into social impact bonds. I think there might be something there, the germ of something there, that might help set light, uh, set light to a marker that hasn't, for me, come close to fully fulfilling its potential so far. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to, I think there's a couple, uh, two or three more in the room in a second. Let me take one from Peter Mandelson, uh, who devoted some of his life to this, um, a point he makes. Um, 
saying uh, economic growth, investment, and social mobility improved between 1997 and 2008, stalled under the financial crisis, and then crashed after 2010. The RDAs, the regional development authorities, became serious means of policy intervention, and their abolition was wanton destruction. Would Andy care to agree? <laughs> This is called a leading question. Do you think? Um, um, look, I mean, on, 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 uh, on that, at, at one point I would strongly agree with, uh, which goes in the spirit of Peter's question, uh, is that there has been uh, structural underinvestment uh, in civic institutions of all forms in this country over many uh, decades. We've had opportunities, and the RDA perhaps one, to reinvigorate them. Uh, but in general, the pattern over many, many years, many, many decades has, won, has been one of them being depleted of capacity and capability. And that we do need to course correct mm. if Devo is to be a success. Uh, I mean, one of the main reasons, um, for example, uh, the Greater Manchester Merrill combined Authority is perceived as having made great progress um, is because the foundations of that were laid over the preceding hmm. uh, 10 years by Richard Lees and Howard Bernstein. Uh, so that was the slow reaccretion of skills and capacity and capability at the civic level. And that is something that rebuilding job something we need to see now in mm. more places across the UK. The Merrill Combined Authority provides one means of doing that. The county deals provide, I hope, another. But I wouldn't underestimate the importance of that. In fact, I'd put that four square as being central to making a success of the levelling up claim. OK, thank you. Um, we're coming towards the end. I'm going to try and take the three in the room that are here uh, together um, and then at least give a gesture to the kind of things people are asking uh, afterwards. Right here in the front. Hi, uh, Chris Dobson from EY. Um, you've talked about your missions being quite long term. I just wonder if you might say a bit more about quick wins and whether you think they're important to maintain support for the agenda and where you see the best opportunities. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's take a couple of others at the same time. Uh, Alex, did you have one? Thank you very much, uh, Alex Nice, Institute for Government. Um, you mentioned that levelling up is a shared endeavour, or should be a shared endeavour, between the UK government and the devolved governments. And you also mentioned the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, um, which replaces EU structural funds where the devolved governments had a lot of autonomy in deciding how that money was spent. Will something similar be replicated with the UK Shared Prosperity Fund? Will they have a say in how those funds are used in their territories? Thank you. And here, over here. Thanks. <laughs> I wasn't aware of my hands up, actually. Um, so, um, Akash, would you like to say who you are? Yes. Hi, I'm Akash Brown, uh, Institute for Government, as well, working on uh, devolution here. So um, I'm just interested in um, the aspirations for the new devolution deals in, in county areas. Um, you talked about the success in Greater Manchester, for instance, being based on long history of, of collaboration between local leaders there. It also, of course, um, is quite a recognisable econ functional economic area, which, which previously has been the, the basis on which devolution deals have been done. Um, with the county deals and the, the new devolution principles, there's a bit of a vaguer language about trying to do deals based on sensible geography, which takes into account economics, but also identity and existing uh, administrative boundaries and so on. So I just wonder if you could say a bit more about exactly how it's going to be, or it's, it's being determined at what scale uh, is the right one to, 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 to devolve powers, because that's, that's frequently been a, a, a challenge in the past in, in actually getting devolution to stick. Okay, great. So we've got quick wins, the structural prosperity funds, and will the devolved administrations have a say? And um, Akash's question on the scale and level of, of powers. Thanks. Uh, so so on, on, on quick wins, um, it was Chris first, wasn't it? Um, uh, so I think this progress can be made in short order on Devo. 
Uh, I think there's progress that can be made uh, in short order uh, in a number of strands of government policy, uh, where there's action in the near term, health inequalities being a, a case in point. I think there's progress that will be made with a second wave, for example, of the levelling uh, up fund and various other funds, no shortage of funds, um, uh, that will be, you know, in second or third waves, be put, be put to work. So I think this will start to feel more visible and tangible uh, during the course of the next six months, needs to feel more tangible and visible over the course of the next six months, bearing in mind that ultimately success lies in the middle distance. Another quick win, or quickish win, to the second question will be around the SPF, where we'll learn more about that um, soon. Um, this will not be a cut and paste, a lift and shift uh, of EU structural funds. Uh, we'll at least match them in monetary terms, uh, but there'll be greater flexibility and greater local discretion about how those funds are deployed to go precisely to your uh, question. We're expanding the range of activities that can be supported through the SPF, and we are localising, subsidiarising the discharge of the decisions to a much more local level than was the case previously under the EU structural funds. For me, both of those things would, would make for a, a better, more localised deployment of those monies than was the case previously. In other words, an improvement uh, on where we were uh, previously. And finally, to Akash's question, uh, a very good one. I mean, uh, I mean you're right um, that uh, you know, a defining feature of all the tiers of DIVA that we set out in the framework is that they cover uh, a functional economic area is the language that we use. What does that mean? Uh, it has no very clean-cut or clear-cut uh, definition. We do define a minimum, a minimum threshold of numbers of people, which is half a million uh, people, uh, which helps in terms of, you know, need to be of a certain size to, bene to benefit from those agglomeration benefits of, of scale uh, and of scope. There's nothing magic about half a million, just a round number, basically. Um, uh, truth be told, I mean, the, the map is messy. There is no, you know, uh, perfect um, overlap between administrative areas and economic areas. Uh, we were quite keen in our framework to leave lots of flex. This wasn't the case of directing areas to have a Devo deal and defining their geography. Lots of scope uh, for collaboration between areas in, uh, in doing that. And as part of that, you know, we, we lent support not just to kind of conventional Devo, county deals, mayoral combined authorities and the like, but also for partnerships that span regions that are defined more by the economic geography than by the administrative geography. So, you know, Western Gateway, uh, West Midlands Engine, uh, Northern Powerhouse Partnership, there are examples of the joining of hands across administrative boundaries in a way that better match the economic cluster, if you like, as distinct mm. from the administrative cluster. There will be those messy overlaps in the fullness of time, they may become a little bit mm. less messy. I hope that is the case. Mm. But ultimately, the defining thing here is more powers locally, whether to leaders or to businesses or to civil society, and the encouragement, the incentivizing, to use a bit of econo speak, um, of people to get together and to make a difference locally, supported, coordinated, sometimes partially financed from central government. Andy, thank you very much. We're sadly going to have to draw to a close then. We've done the hour and two minutes, which is almost unknown that we break uh, IFG scheduling things. But um, thank you very much for the questions which come in, the terrific range, which we couldn't possibly get to. But um, Adrian Brown, thank you for the question about other countries in the world and, and which ones have successfully levelled up. I would love to have got into, particularly the East German um, question, but we can't. Um, but thank you. A lot about health, uh, Ben Wealthy uh, and others saying uh, what about the you know, particular demands of health and, and the cuts in local health funding. An awful lot about uh, funding in generally, uh, generally and the role of the Treasury. Thank you, Michaela. A um, lot about cross-party support and is all this money going to conservative areas. Um, uh, a bit about Ukraine and uh, energy and uh, a lot then at the end about civil society and civic pride. And we can't get onto any of these 
things right now, uh, but we and many others are going to be writing and talking a lot about this, and I'm sure Andy Holden is as well. In your, I can't call it your next job, your, 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 uh, your return to your job that you are about to start. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, and everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you.